Hello everybody! Welcome to another episode! Today we're going to be talking about the Suez Canal crisis, which is misleading because there was a much more violent crisis back in the 70s. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the big ass boat that got stuck in the Suez Canal, blocked the whole thing, billions and billions of dollars wasted, and it's actually been free. Now we're going to get into the whole story. Alright, let's get started. So, first, let's get some context, as usual, from Wikipedia. The Suez Canal is an artificial sea-level waterway. So, just so you know, sea-level waterways mean that there's no locks in the canal. So, the canal is basically just a really, 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 really long river. There's no part where you shut a gate and then fill it with water to rise the boat up. That doesn't happen, okay? The Suez Canal, you can just think of it as a really, really, really long trench, which is different from the other major canals in the world. But we're not going to get into that. I'm just explaining what sea level waterway means, okay? Connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea through the Isthmus of Suez and dividing Africa and Asia. Construction of the canal lasted from 1859 to 1869, 10 years and took place under the auspices of the Ottoman Empire. The canal officially opened on the 17th of November in 1869. Avoiding the South Atlantic and Southern Indian Oceans reduces the journey distance from the Arabian Sea to London by approximately 8,900 kilometers, 5,500 miles, or eight days at 24 knots to 10 days at 20 knots. So you're talking about a 40-day journey going down to 30 days thanks to the canal. That's a 25% decrease in fuel, which is the biggest expense for these giant shipping companies. There was an invasion of Egypt in late 56 by Israel, followed by the United Kingdom and France. So Israel, UK, and France versus Egypt. After the fighting had started, political pressure from the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Nations led to a withdrawal by the three invaders. The episode humiliated the United Kingdom and France and strengthened Egypt. To the news. A surreal photo going viral on Twitter shows a massive container ship stuck sideways in the Suez Canal blocking traffic in one of the world's busiest waterways. The awkwardly placed container ship has been identified as the Ever Given, which set off from the Suez port in Egypt on March 23rd, and it was expected to arrive in the Netherlands on March 31st. Ooh, that's only, that's only like seven days later, eight days later. It's unclear if the Ever Given will ever reach its destination on time. One of the busiest shipping lanes in the world, the Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and sees about 40 transits every day. It's 120 miles long and 80 feet deep and 673 feet wide. Its unfortunate predicament has severely disrupted maritime traffic in the area, causing indefinite delays for cargo ships that need to pass through the canal, including oil tankers from Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. Wall Street Journal adds, A rescue team was able to restart the ship's rudder and propeller the previous day after it veered into the eastern side of the canal during stormy conditions earlier this week, completely blocking the busy waterway to traffic. Some 320 vessels are currently waiting to traverse the 120-mile channel. Authorities said they are cautiously optimistic about dislodging the vessel, but Osama Rabi, head of the Suez Canal Authority that manages the channel, said Saturday afternoon that he couldn't provide a time frame for reopening the canal. Tugboats are continuing their attempts to pull the ship out from the thick sediment lighting the side of the canal. Mr. Rabbi also said that the rescue team was considering how to further lighten the vessel's load, including using other ships and mobile cranes to unload containers, though he said the team was hoping it would not have to pursue such measures. We cannot set a determined time to finish, said Mr. Rabbi. Later, Breitbart adds, Suez, Egypt. Salva's teams on Monday freed a colossal container ship that was stuck 
ne for nearly a week in the Suez Canal, ending a crisis that has clogged one of the world's most vital waterways and halted billions of dollars a day in maritime commerce. Helped by high tide, a flotilla of tugboats wrecks the bulbous bow of the skyscraper-sized Ever Given from the canal's sandy bank, where it had firmly been lodged since March 23rd. The tugs blared their horns in jubilation as they guided the Ever Given through the waterways after days of futility that had captivated the world, drawing scrutiny and social media mockery. The giant vessel headed towards the Great Bitter Lake, a wide stretch of water halfway between the north and south ends of the canal, where it will be inspected, said Evergreen Marine Corps, a major Taiwan-based shipping company that operates the ship. I thought it was Japanese-owned. Taiwan-based, Japanese-owned, I think that's what it is. Reuters adds, Cairo, March 29th, the container ship that was grounded in the Suez Canal and was refloated on Monday has been inspected and is undamaged and the canal is navigatable, the canal's chairman told Egypt's Nile Television. The New York Post added, the first ship to make it through the Suez Canal since the vital waterway was reopened after the colossal container ship was finally freed Monday is reportedly through. Ship tracking website marinetraffic.com showed more than 100 vessels traveling through the newly unclogged canal in both directions Monday night following the wishes successful passage. A senior canal pilot told the Associated Press on condition of anonymity that experts were looking for signs of damage and trying to determine the cause of the vessel's grounding. When blame gets assigned, it could turn into years of legal wranglings over the costs of repairing the ship, fixing the canal, and reimbursing those who saw their cargo shipments disrupted. And with the ship being owned by a Japanese company, operated by a Taiwanese shipper, flagged in Panama, and being stuck in Egypt, the mishap turned into an international mess. Vice adds, as of Monday, midday, 193 vessels were stuck at Port Said in the north of Egypt, and 201 were anchored in the southern seaport city of the Suez. There were an additional 43 ships waiting inside the Great Bitter Lake. Last week, some had predicted that it could take weeks for the Ever Given, which is one of the largest container ships in the world, to be freed. Some shipping companies made the calculus that it would ultimately be more cost-effective to reroute their vessels around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa. The largest shipping company in the world, Denmark-based Maersk, said on Monday that it had already rerouted 15 of its vessels towards the southern tip of Africa and is currently recalculating whether it should turn those ships back towards their original route through the Suez Canal. Another fear about the blockage centered on energy concerns. The longer the Ever Given remained stuck, the worse of an effect it would have on global energy markets. There were fears that not only the oil trade between Europe and Asia would be affected, but also bent crude oil dropped more than 1% immediately after the vessel was set free. Among the hundreds of ships stuck in the Suez Canal, some 200 or 20 vessels holding tens of thousands of animals. Animal advocacy groups have been worried that food rations aboard the ships could be running low as the days spent anchoring wear on. Romania has 11 of those ships, containing 105,000 sheep and 1,600 cattle, according to Romania's veterinary watchdog, which added that the steps have been taken to prioritize the vessels. The watchdog also said that Egypt has been provided supplemental food and water for uh, Egypt has been providing supplemental food and water for the animals. Now, let's see what people are saying. Lost Woods in the Fields adds, for it to take the crown of the worst Suez Canal traffic jam, I would question this. I'm guessing there is more traffic now and the value of the goods going is greater, considering the ship is blocking can hold 15,000 containers on its own. So I wonder what one week of blocking in 2020 equals to 1970s blocking. 
Uh, for reference, so in the 1970s, there was a, uh, like, okay, that's what we referenced earlier. Believe it or not, that irrelevant bullshit I was telling you about colonialism and invading and European powers and crap, that was relevant because, uh, that was the, like, a, a long period of time where the Suez Canal was essentially inoperable because it was under war. Uh, basically, foreign powers were trying to take the Suez Canal but the Suez Canal was in Egypt. So, right, I don't need to elaborate too much more on that. And it actually, Egypt got it. And that kind of, for a lot of historians, that era kind of marks a turning point where colonial colonialism is truly like dying and shifted. So very powerful companies like the, or very powerful countries like the United States are still able to be colonialist simply because they are like they have the most resources and there's not another entity really to check them whereas almost all the other nations it's not you can't be blatantly colonialist anymore you can't go invade a land you have to you have to economically Invade and subjugate it, basically, which is what they do. They, they're not good. I'm not saying that, oh, colonialism is just dead. The concepts, by and by, just shifted. And a lot of the people in power are still minorities, and they still believe that if we don't suppress these other people, these other countries, that the world's gonna go to shit. But, yeah, that's debatable. Anyway, moving on, right? Hacking Dreams adds, if you wanted to do a lot of damage to Europe, for sure, block the Suez Canal. If you wanted to damage the Americas, you blow up the locks at Panama and let Gatam drain la or lake drain out into the ocean. Plenty of fiction has been written about both. You would basically need to be a Bond villain to even want to try it. Useful Woodpecker adds, it already happened once in the 60s during the war between Egypt and Israel. And more. It wasn't just Egypt and Israel. The canal was blocked for eight years and 15 ships were trapped in it. When it was over, only two of those 15 ships survived. All other ships, in order to continue, had to travel around Africa. The cost of virtually everything went up. Hacking Dreams adds, Can someone explain why does it take this long to rescue the cargo ship? Inertia. Ship got wedged in thousands upon thousands of pounds of sand and mud. They now have to dig enough of that out on the way to let the ship go back to floating. Ship weighs a lot. Even with a fleet of tugboats, there's only so much they can do without making things worse. According to Evergreen, they've already dredged 20,000 tons of material and have cleared the ship's stern and found no damage to the rudder, rudder or propeller, so they're free to use the ship's own power to bring it back underway at their next refloat attempt. Woods in the field adds, Livestock and few foods, such as fruits, etc., are probably completely lost, at least in viability for the import companies. The insurance payouts for this are going to be in the billions. I wonder if any import companies are trying to sell off their containers for dirt cheap. If that's even an option. <laughs> yeah, could you get, like, uh, a, a container of oranges that are a week past their prime for, like, you know, a couple thousand dollars? <laughs> Probably just the container's price at that point. Kmart, Kmart Chopper adds, I think the scale of the problem really precludes any real accountability. I can't imagine any shipping corporation could even start to pay for even a fraction of the costs incurred by something like this going under. That's not to say one will not try to, but even 1% of the costs incurred by the accident could be an astronomically large number. Ship posts over 9,000. Ads. A lot of the numbers being thrown around on this are somewhat misleading as far as a price. The actual impact is closer to the difference of going through the canal versus the next cheapest route, or choosing a vendor shipping through the canal versus the next cheapest vendor that doesn't. The figures being quoted in most of the news articles are using the total value of goods, not the differential costs. Some perishable goods will undoubtedly be lost, and some shipments will undoubtedly be cancelled, so there is some cost there, but it is nowhere near as high as some of the figures being quoted are by the press. 
Depending on if the inquiry labels this as negligence or accidental, the operator will pay wildly different amounts. But it is unlikely, even if it was shown to be negligence, that they would end up covering that much, if any, of the cost the other ships, and even if they did, it would be more asking the lines of a percentage of the shipping costs, not the total market price value of the cargo, in most cases. It's also important to understand that it's not so much that, okay, the Suez Canal is the only way in the world to get there. It's just the shortest way, and usually there's not a problem. So most of these companies had planned for that. They can, they can actually sail around Africa. And that sounds like a lot, and it is, but again, it, it adds like a quarter to the journey or a third. So you're talking about the cost of the, what they charge going up by like 30 or 30% uh, or a quarter, or like 25%. And that, that's something that would be mitigated more than that. It wouldn't literally go up that much because these companies, when they can plan for something and they know what their options are, uh, things kind of balance out and reflect to accommodate that. The problem with this main way being blocked is it's not like, okay, if this is blocked, there's not just an easy bypass. You have to literally go around an entire continent or you could just wait. And that is an uncertainty that really wrecked them financially because they can't plan for that once it's happening. Now they can, of course. Of course, every single one of these companies now is like, okay, going through a canal is a risk. It's a liability. And this is going to create some situation where if the Suez Canal gets blocked, then, you know, you have a little bit of a longer way to go, but it's not as long as going around all of Africa, because, you know, the Suez Canal has another canal next to it or something like that. And usually you find that demand kind of creates these processes. And if it hasn't happened yet, then the demand simply isn't strong enough to overpower or whatever the fuck is stopping it. Original poster adds, the Suez Canal crisis, this Suez Canal crisis, shows how vulnerable global supply chains actually are. Oil, gas, and food prices could rise. Those vulnerabilities have been around for some time. Trade tensions between the United States and China, and the threat of trade restrictions over vaccines are also major issues. This data was prepared by Vessels of Value for the Financial Times, and this animated infographic shown in the original post was rendered in Adobe After Effects. This just shows how valuable well-maintained infrastructure is to the world. The supply chain isn't vulnerable. It's fine, but slightly less efficient for now. There's plenty of alternatives. Supply chains adjust, prices will fluctuate, but everything is gonna be okay. Hacking Dreams adds, honestly, the biggest thing it does for me is make me realize that Africa is in desperate need of true intermodal shipping infrastructure like we have in the United States. Canal gets shut down, Make Ankara, Port Sudan. Pull your containers off and put them on a train to Port Said. Put them back on a boat in the Med to continue the journey to Europe. This is literally why the US Department of Defense standardized shipping containers after World War II in the first place, such that cargo could continue moving regardless mode of transport, even if existing supply chains are disrupted. Playing one-handed adds, nah. It normally gets jammed and boats wait. Depends on boats and time, they may wait to get tugged and have to pay to get tugged through it. It's a great shortcut, but a lot of boats actually just go around anyway. Most people are talking about the India, China to UK. The most affected are in the India countries just on the Mediterranean Sea. They are being forced to go via trucks for the relatively short trip. Hacking Dreams adds, Exactly how fast do you and these people who think it'd add just a couple of days to their journey think that these ships move? The long way around is an extra 9,000 kilometers. You'd have to move at 125 kilometers an hour non-stop across the water to make that distance. Most of these container ships can't break 50 kilometers. It's at the very least an extra week on the journey. More likely an extra two or three given the stops needed to take on extra fuel and give the crews relief. Catsup 1989 adds, The last Suez Canal crisis ended the British Empire. Imagine fucking up so hard that you end up repeating the problem that ended up with the biggest empire in global history. That's gotta be a stern letter of reprimand at minimum. 
It's like causing a highway pileup so bad that it ended the USA. Eh, that's a very, like, colonialism the way it was couldn't sustain itself. The, the Suez Canal crisis isn't the only thing that ended the British Empire. Like, basically, as technology advanced and humans became able to be aware of freedom in other countries and communicate and access information, that sheer force alone ended the reality of people being able to be colonialized. We like to think that it's about like, oh, this war happened and that meant that this had to happen and it was because this power and democracy was spread across the land, but like, Really, a lot of countries, whether you're democratic or you're, you live in a, like a, a socialist country or something, um, you're better off now than you were 50 years ago. Te technology evolving and human's access to other humans in other parts of the world has made it such that we benefit so much from each other now in a way that we never used to. A person in Latin America in the 1500s and a person in Europe in the 1500s and a person in China in the 1500s had almost zero probability of ever even witnessing the other person for a moment, not even seeing an image of them, hearing nothing about their culture, maybe hearing some judgment about people, but a lot of times they literally didn't even know that person existed. The world was so different and it was so easy to manipulate people and control their access to information. Whereas now, you have seen people from other nations, you have heard other languages, you may not know them, but you've heard them. You've seen movies where you've seen people's faces who are foreign. Maybe you've even talked to a foreigner. Maybe you are a foreigner. We live in a totally different world. The British Empire wasn't sustainable. The Suez Canal crisis isn't what ended the British Empire. It marked the ending of the British Empire. That's quite different, right? The reality was all empires as they were could not sustain. All areas had to be culturally put down to similar groups of people who felt at least enough in the same way that they weren't trying to actively kill each other. And then each region of groups of people who kind of tolerated each other without trying to kill each other, there had to be no foreign involvement because that's the natural process. There's a group of people in an area that have similar culture, they're similar influence. They have a, usually some kind of big disagreement. There's some civil war that's either resolved or not resolved because, you know, it, it, people from both sides always end up living, right? But usually that has to happen again with no foreign involvement. If there's any element of foreign involvement in the picture, that process doesn't develop. And that has to continue. And then once after the, the Civil War, there's usually some kind of more, more united people. And as US people, we like to think that, oh, these, it only matters if they become democratic. But you can't, democracy is something that properly nourished humans with access to material and good examples and information, they will develop democracies. When that doesn't happen, it's because of a lack of access to information and a lack of resources, not because you didn't force them to be democratic. When you try and force a country to be democratic, it retaliates and it, that does not work. You cannot force it. It is something that has to grow naturally from within. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And the problem with most of our, our wealthy countries now is that they still are colonialist and that they stay as an influence and they have so much power that it just completely dwarfs the natural balance of power within these developing countries. And it's, it becomes not about how can you unite your country and figure out how to bring people together as a leader, 
That isn't what matters anymore. What matters is how can you get the money from that other power to fuel your army. And that is the wrong way to influence. You don't want that to be the most convenient thing for leaders. You want them to be the convenient thing for a leader should always be to bring their people together and develop a very large following that represents the majority of their country. That should be the most useful thing for them. It should be what is convenient for them. And if it's not, we have issues we gotta work on, right? All right, everybody, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this kind of content, please do one of the four following. Like this video, subscribe to this channel, check out another video, or comment below. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Ciao!